What's up, hustlers? This is Andrew Morgans from Marknology back with you on the Startup Hustle. I've got Trevor Kratz with us today. We're going to cover all things e-commerce, um, talk about his history and, and his place in digital um, and get to know him a little bit. Uh, before we get started, uh, Trevor is a pipeline entrepreneur. Um, and so we're going to be talking, not only is this episode sponsored by that, we're going to talk a little bit about what Pipeline Entrepreneurs is. Uh, it's a fellowship program for high growth entrepreneurs currently recruiting for their 2021 fellowship class. Apply at pipelineentrepreneurs.com. We'll get into that. Hello, Trevor. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. No problem at all. Um, I used to like to start the show out just like getting to know, um, getting to know you a little bit, like getting the audience a little bit about, about your background and, and what's got you here today. Um, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me a little bit about Buddy Brand and Shop. Um, just me up. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I am an entrepreneur that dabbles in a lot of different things. And I, I guess some would say I probably have shiny object syndrome, um, which I know a lot of us are afflicted with, but, uh, you know, my story starts off about 10 years ago. Uh, I was a corporate trainer in the human mattress industry and I saw firsthand how, uh, the right support system had really made an impact on customers. I mean, it had fixed backs and taken away pain that had been bothering people for, for decades. And, you know, at the time I got my, I got a large dog, uh, buddy, the, uh, buddy, the Labradoodle and, uh, buddy was, uh, a couple years old. And I was really surprised to find out that his life expectancy wasn't near as long as my previous dog. Um, the reason is okay. because big dogs tend to have shortened life because they get, uh, they get, uh, painful joint problems and hip dysplasia and obviously, and oftentimes the quality of life goes downhill. And with that, uh, you get, uh, you know, euthana euthanasia and people put their dogs, uh, put their dogs down uh, at an earlier rate. And so when I really discovered all this, uh, I, I knew firsthand how important support and sleep was to the body. And I, it was easy for me to see that there was nothing in the pet industry that had anything that was really, uh, uh, supportive or pressure relieving. Uh, so we decided to do something, not just for my dog, but for the millions of dogs out there that were destined to suffer the same fate. Uh, and we decided to do something proactive and put them on a pressure-free support system. And that's how we started. We started with a company called Buddy Rest, uh, makers of the world's best dog beds. Um, okay. Started start off pretty primitive. I mean, if you go back to the, the very beginning, we, uh, we made one product. I uh, didn't know if anybody'd like it. Everybody told us it was way too expensive. No one's going to spend more than you know more than fifty bucks on a dog bed. Um, we took it to a show. I mean, it was a mess. We didn't even have our website it wasn't working. Uh, our banner had, I think, a misspelling on it. It was just a disaster. But one thing that it really did do is it put us in touch with con and into contact with customers. And those customers, uh, they gave yeah. us enough interest, and uh, they they really. Uh, they, they basically made us think, hey, maybe we've got something here. And so from there, we decided to, we got our website working. We found a customer and then we found another customer and then another customer. And we, we bootstrapped this thing organically for the first couple of years and just uh, and grew Buddy Rest. Uh, and that's what we did. Okay. Uh, um, well, one, I specifically know about like, uh, I'm young 30s. And I remember when I like uh, first got my mattress that like changed my life and i started sleeping without back pain and like was yeah. you know i invested in it. it was like the most expensive thing i owned honestly more expensive than my car and uh i was just like look if i'm gonna get less sleep as an entrepreneur i'm trying to get like good sleep and uh you know invested in a bed thing, right? what's that the whole work smarter not harder thing right sleep smarter that i was taking it literal yeah uh so no i 100 percent understand and and I've always grown up with boxers, which are probably that kind of like medium sized big dog that you're talking about that has kind of a shorter lifespan than, um, you know, a lot of dogs. So I can definitely relate. Uh, talking about the early beginnings where you started, like where you focused on retail and like doing trade shows and things like that and the website or was it focused on ours? Yeah, that's a great question. Our initial focus was on wholesale. Um, you know, okay. there, had been, there had been kind of a revolution in at the same kind of period of time um, around uh, dog food. So, you know, dog food uh, once was just a, a commodity people picked up at the grocery store. All of a sudden people are spending, you know, 50, 60, 70, $80 for a bag of dog food. They're cooking 
uh, they're, they're cooking food for their their dog. They're buying raw food for their dog. And the real the, the question is, is why are they doing this? And it's because it's better for the health of their animal. And that was really what mm -hmm. propelled us is that why should you buy our beds or why should you bring our beds into your store? It's the same thing. It's better for the health of the animal. Um, and we, we equated our challenge with educating the customer into what, it, you know, there's, there's more out of a dog bed than just uh, something that's going to, you know, uh, be something to lay on for a couple weeks, a couple months, you know, wash once, deteriorate, throw in the trash. And we wanted to make something that was long term, that was durable, that was fresh relieving, vet recommended. And it took a lot of education to, to get that uh, that piece over. So for the first several years, um, actually the first two years, we really pushed hard to get it into retailers. And we got about five, 600 stores. But what we found was is we were great at getting the orders, but not the reorders. And and the reason why we weren't getting the reorders okay. we figured, uh, is because the educational piece was big. And so we could articulate the value prop to our customer uh, or even the store owner but they had trouble translating the value prop down to their 16 year old summertime employee, part-time employee. And they were having a hard time articulating that to the customer. So ultimately uh, it was a really tough go about it. So after the first few years, we decided to transition um, uh, almost completely into a direct to consumer and e-commerce model. And so um, today, Buddy Rest, uh, to close the loop on the Buddy Rest story, Buddy Rest today is still one of our, our bigger properties um we uh sell through uh, our own sites and then we sell through partner sites like target and cabela's and bass pro and wayfair um and it's it's still a, a great uh a great brand for us in fact we recently won the world branding award in vienna austria last year which was tremendous we actually congratulations started. yeah thank you it was, it was uh it was an amazing experience we actually went over there and, and we went into this, this opulent palace and uh, we were with a who's who of uh, pet people and, and got that recognition, which was fantastic. Um, you know, but ultimately, you know, the recognition that really means the most to us is when we hear from our customers and how our products have really changed the life of animals, uh, you know, maybe uh, help them in their senior years or even some cases gave them, uh, you know, a, a pain free haven to, to spend their, their final moments on. Uh, and so with the buddy rest story, you know, that's that's really. Uh, where we are today and so we switched from that going back to your question we switched from that uh, direct to consumer we switched from that wholesale model into a strictly e-commerce model pretty early on about eight years ago so you can just you know control i guess the education of the customer like you know the whole way whether it's the follow-up email videos or the landing pages or um just handle all of that yourself instead of counting on those brick and mortars or those retailers to do it for you yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's nothing that's going to be able to articulate the the message, uh, you know, uh, like first off, like a founder or, or someone in the company, and then and and the second off, like the internet's going to be able to, you know, with the the variety of media available, um, they're going to be able to tell the story and why you should purchase and tie the features and the benefits in a unique way that raises perceived value. They're going to be able to do that much better than any part time salesperson. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, we, we help brand Marknology helps brands on Amazon and e-commerce. And that's one of the big things we find is that, um, there's a disconnect even between the founder or whoever's running, you know, the product and then like the consultation of that. And like, you know, the founders can be so confident, like, how can they not understand this, this is a no brainer. Um, but then whenever you're talking to the customers and interacting with the customers and making that relationship, you hear that there's something lost in between and you know a big part of like getting conversion rates and getting those customers coming back is simply the education part um you know working through a brand right now where um their messaging their marketing their sales their images their copy everything was focused on sales and they were doing a great job of convincing people to buy um but whether it was earns or those you know those repurchases there was just wasn't enough education going on so we've we've swapped out out salesy stuff educational stuff and we're in you know good results there so Absolutely. okay let's close the chapter there uh tell me about scan shop tell me about some of the other projects you have going on um yeah well let's talk a little bit more about how buddy rest evolved and then because i think it naturally evolves into the scan shop story um but okay I'd absolutely yeah i'd love to be able to tell both so with buddy rest you know we uh after a couple of years we found ourselves with a kind of a nice lifestyle business it was uh it was a great business, but at the same time, it was a niche. You know, you're looking at uh, 
you know, dog beds that are uh, built, you know, tough, made in the USA. They're, they're built to be uh, uh, an investment in the future of the dog. Uh, but they, you know, they aren't 20 or $30 and, and not everyone, they're not for everyone. Uh, and so what we did is we looked for opportunities to either uh, build or buy our way into more market share. And so over the years, over the last uh, nine and a half years, we've been in business, almost 10 here. Uh, we've been uh, very opportunistic. We've either uh, built a brand uh, like our Tough Butt brand, which is geared towards uh, military working dogs and, uh, and uh, tactical equipment for animals. Um, or uh, we bought our brand like uh, Natural Doggy, which is uh, you know, derived only the best, most natural ingredients for your dog. And the reason why we have these multiple brand approach is pretty simple. It's that not all dog people are the same. Uh, and in this mm -hmm. day and age, as you're well aware, with digital marketing, it's super important that the brand speaks and resonates in a way to that to that, to that end consumer, that target avatar. And so that's why now uh, Buddy Brands has a collection of different uh, brands in our portfolio. Uh, of course, we have Buddy Rest Still, which is an orthopedic dog beds, but we also have uh, Pup IQ, Tough Pup, Natural Doggy, uh, Pet Envy, and Brown Baggers. And all of these uh, represent different uh, values and different products and, and uh, going after different types of the market. I love it. Um, do you guys develop for, you know, third parties like private label and, you know, kind of create products like that? Or is it strictly yeah. internal? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, oftentimes we're asked, okay, well, well, what's the continuity that ties this all together? And really like the, the focus of our brand is our, the drivers of our business is about solving problems. So we're in the solution based pet products business. There's a lot of people that do, you know, furry bow ties that are super cute, but that's just not what we do. We do solution based mm -hmm. products, products that solve anx anxiety, allergies, pain, mobility, um, and really just things that enhance the bond between animal and dog. Um, going back, uh, you know, to your question, um, you know, when we do our solution based products, you know, they're, they're focused on, um, really solving these problems and the continuity between everything is that, um, uh, but ultimately, uh, I started rambling so much. I lost where I was going with that. What was your original question? <laughs> just, just talking about like, you know, our, do you guys only develop products for, for okay. your brands yeah. or private label? Yeah so, yeah. so going back to what I was saying is that we make solution based products. And so for customers, so uh, for, for our clients or other, you know, third party uh, companies that are looking for uh, solution based pet products, we do create uh, some amazing solutions for them as well. So we have uh, uh, third party part, third party products in the market, specifically with our dog beds, we're well known worldwide for, for our quality and for our innovation. And so we make dog beds for companies like Wayfair under their own brand name. Uh, we make some dog beds for uh, Gunner Kennel Company, CC Animal Health and a couple others. And so we, we, uh, we definitely have private label as a big part of our business. So um, yeah, we, uh, we're always looking at attacking the market in multiple different ways uh, and trying to be as innovative with our approach to the market as we are with our products. I love that. I love that. And it's a great way to, you know, one, build relationships, uh, drive down costs, you know, um, you diversify, uh, you know, and something, something big that um, as I dig more and more into e-commerce and brands that we're working with, we see that, you know, a lot of them are even though they're developing their own products for their own brands, they're, they're de developing for others as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think if the opportunity is there for you, uh, you know, oftentimes in the, in the early days, I was very protective and oftentimes I see people are very protective over their brand. Uh, but white labeling and private labeling, I think is definitely a great opportunity for, for most companies if you're in the market to do so. Yeah. Especially if you believe in your products, like, you know, you're essentially getting, uh, good supplements or good beds or good products out there that are helping more dogs, you know, and helping more owners. Um, so why not? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we are uh, absolutely a business where we are not a nonprofit. Um, but uh, our products truly do uh, inc improve the lives of animals and they make uh, pet ownership uh, an easier situation. And so, 
you know, we like to say that when our head hits the pillow, uh, you know, we're not trying to save the world, but we can feel really good about the contribution that we make on a daily basis. Our products really do help animals, especially senior dogs, which I have a soft spot, spot in my heart for. A hundred percent. So, um, you know, this episode is, is sponsored by Pipeline, Pipeline Entrepreneurs. Let's talk about um, how that fits into this and, and you know, uh, how long have you been connected with them um, and what projects are you working on, you know, through that program? Sure. So the pipeline program uh, is uh, came out of the Coffin Foundation in Kansas City, um, and it's been around for several years now. Um, and a lot of people are wonder what it is. Is it an accelerator? Do they take equity? What are what are we doing? And and it's hard to articulate it to people. Oftentimes, I find the easiest way to explain it is that if you are a uh, High, a high level, high functioning entrepreneur, and you're the real deal, and you've got some real business in front of you, then this is a tribe. And this is a tribe that you, that, of crazy people like you that you can come and talk to and they can help you along the path. Uh, and then and the, they can just collaborate with you. You know, I, I oftentimes, especially being in Wichita, you know, there's a few entrepreneurs in town that I, I, uh, I associate with and uh, uh, some older ones too that are, are great mentors, but ultimately there's not a lot of peers, you know, when it mm-hmm. comes to people who understand what it's like to, to, you know, to, to put the house up and, and to have to come home and, and with bad news and these types of things. And so it's a tribe of like-minded people uh, that can really help you along your journey. Now there is a curriculum. So if you join pipeline, which I, I highly recommend everybody applies, it does not mean you'll automatically get in. Um, but if you do, there's a, a one year fellowship where there is a curriculum and, and you do learn a lot about your business and yourself. Uh, but ultimately after that, the focus is on the group. And, you know, a lot of people like to say it's a network. It's a lot more than network. It's a family, it's a tribe. Uh, and I say apply because it's not for everybody and not everybody gets in. It's very, uh, uh, it's very selective. Uh, we're very super, super focused on a cultural fit and making sure that everybody who's in the group is a good fit for each other. Um, you know, I actually went and applied in 2017 and um, I went with a lot of confidence and I, they didn't select me. And I, you know what? My feelings were hurt. And I just mm-hmm. got on stage pitching Damon John in front of like 6,000 people. And I thought I was, you know, I thought I was, uh, I thought it was top stuff. And uh, they didn't, they didn't select me. And so, um, you know, it took me a minute to, to, to swallow my pride. And a, a year later, it took, it took me a year to swallow my pride. And I went back there and I went through two or three more interviews and, uh, I got in and I'm glad that I'm, I'm so glad I made that, made that, uh, that mind shift in my head where, uh, you know, where I'm like, maybe I should eat a little humble pie and try again, because it's been, revolutionary the way it's open not only my eyes my rolodex uh but also as corny as it sounds my heart you know these other these these people that are involved in this program Mm -hmm. they uh, are special people and they're special to me and i'm special to them and we care about each other and that's what pipeline's all about so uh how to wrap that up wow i love it is go apply for pipeline i love it and for anyone this is um sponsorship with uh pipeline entrepreneurs um and and just like um uh, you know talking about that program i could really relate into what you're saying i honestly applied for a program last year uh it wasn't pipeline i hadn't heard of pipeline um but it was with goldman sachs 10 ksb out of boston at babson college and uh it's not in kansas city you know so everything as far as nitty is not local to me here um and covid made this year made it cold for us to connect we were supposed to be out there twice but even in the week i was out there and and follow up not only have i you know got a few clients out of it um you know that i'm helping them on amazon um working with marknology but also just um the camaraderie or like being able to lean on people during you know the pandemic and the ppp loans and just be able to get some advice from some senior people um that were going through the same thing as me and you know, they had to be qualification to even be in. Um, so, you know, at least put us at the same playing field. And there's people are doing catering. There's people, you know, doing planning, all types of businesses in there, not just, 
you know, e-commerce or Amazon or digital marketing. Um, and it was really like, you said it opened your heart. Like for me, it was just, wow, these are real people like, you know, struggling with this. We had a, a small group of like seven and um, was just really impactful. You can feel like you're out here on an island, you know, doing things. And, you know, it's hard for me not to echo your sentiment too about like ones that are real entrepreneurs and are like, you know, there's a big difference between the ones that have actually done something and the ones that have built something past themselves um, and the ones that are talking about getting started, you know, and that's what this podcast is, is by founders, for founders, you know, so this is, this is a community as well. Um, but I was rejected and, you know, there was a bit of ego there as well, or like, you know, my feelings were hurt in regards to like, um, you know, okay, I, I applied, I didn't get it. Okay. Um, next year came around and was really glad I just swallowed it and went forward. And it, it really impacted me and getting me confidence in areas I wouldn't have even imagined, like, you know, finance or, um, you know, scalability in some ways, or like, uh, uh, for the PPP loan, honestly, being sure. prepared for that. You never know what you're going to get out of something. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing that too, because I think uh, an important part that you, that you touched on is that, you know, family is great, but it's, it, it's super, super important when times get tough. Right. And so, and times have been tough for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and uh, you can see the pipelines really stepped up to the plate with programming, with helping with all the things that you just discussed, making sure that people have resources, people have connections, you know, not just checking on our finances, but our mental health, you know, these types of things are important, checking in on each other, connecting, making sure everybody's all right, uh, or as all right as they can be. And, and uh, you know, that's part of the value of, of a program like Pipeline. Um, and there's a lot of programs out there. Um, and uh, I can only speak to what I've been involved with. And I've been through some accelerators and a couple of different things. But Pipeline, it it really is a family and it's a tribe. And uh, if what I'm saying resonates with you, then then go to pipelineentrepreneurs.com and apply. Have you read that book, Tribe by Sebastian Junger? I've not. By chance? Okay. Um, you just, the use of the word tribe, there's not a lot of people that I know that use it. And um, that book was just really impactful. It's an easy read, just talking about, um, you know, community and the need for it. And I know specifically in my space with like Amazon, I've been doing it nine years, helping brands on Amazon. When I started, there was, it felt even more like I was on an Island because there weren't Amazon agencies. There weren't people talking to Amazon. There wasn't this, like I legitimately couldn't find anyone that would listen to what I was talking about, you know? And so it even makes you more reclusive in that regard um, to being like, look, people don't believe in me. I'm just going to stop talking about them and just do my thing. And, and before long, you're just like, it's you. You know, and um, one thing I've realized is that a business doesn't have to be just like mine or the business owner doesn't have to know my business to be able to, you know, really help and dig in and, and be supportive for a different entrepreneur in a different business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and for the entrepreneurs listening, I mean, you're you, first off, you are crazy. OK, you are crazy. Mm -hmm. But the, but the good news is, is you're not the only one that's crazy. Right. We're all crazy. And we're all crazy together. And when you start to see that there's other crazy people just like you, uh, it brings a certain level of comfort. And, um, you know, with what you said, I think was great is just because there's diverse, uh, diverse backgrounds. Like, for example, Pipeline's got some biotech people, some people curing cancer, people like me that make pet products. I mean, there's such a wide variety, but we're all cut from the same cloth, just like you said. And we don't have to be in the exact same industry. To right. Enjoy be able to bring value to each other's lives. And that's, that's, that's what's super important. Awesome. Once again, pipeline entrepreneurs, if you guys are looking for an impactful organization for high growth, uh, visit pipelineentrepreneurs.com or click the link in the show notes to learn more about the power of pipeline entrepreneurs. Trevor, what let's, we've talked a little bit about your past and what got you here. Like, you know, what's in your immediate future, what's in, you know, the, the forecast as far as things you're focusing on, um, either in the business or even just as an entrepreneur? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're in the middle of uh, a, a huge scaling operation with buddy brands. You know, I, um, I, I feel a, a little, what I would call survivor's guilt, uh, because I know that there's so many people out there struggling. The fact that we are heavily into e-commerce with everything that we do, uh, and that we're into pets and people are still spending money on their pets and then they always will. 
Um, it gives us a really, uh, a really interesting opportunity. So, you know, COVID has, um, has somewhat shifted the tides towards us. And so uh, we're very, very, very mm -hmm. fortunate with that. Um, and, you know, uh, I humbly say that, that uh, it's something that I, I genuinely appreciate because I know a lot of people out there are, are not so fortunate. Um, but with that being said, you know, our focus is on scaling the business. Um, we're expecting, you know, quarter four, which we're in now, um, to be the biggest quarter uh, of all time. You know, people are predicting mm -hmm. the biggest e-commerce uh, e uh, season in history, obviously, for uh, many reasons, but obviously with COVID. Um, and so that's what we're focused on, um, scaling the business up. How can we really, you know, turn uh, our inventory, you know, fast and, uh, and, and really um, bring a lot of value? Um, on that same note, with the scale situation comes, you know, we're 80 20 everything. So we're losing lots of our lines. Uh, we're, we're, we're killing some things that might be a little close to our hearts here and there and, and making some tough decisions. So that's what we're doing on the Buddy brand side. Um, and then, uh, you know, through Buddy Rest, if you go to BuddyRest.com, for example, you'll be able to go to right now, you'll be able to go and look at our dog beds. And you'll also be able to, to access a feature called View in My Room which if you are on a mobile phone, any Android or any iPhone in the last five years can really run this, uh, but it's an augmented reality piece that will take our dog bed. It will show you what it looks like in your room and it's an authentic experience. So it really looks good. It looks real and it allows you to bridge the gap between shopping in a store and shopping at home. In fact, it takes it mm -hmm. one step further because in store, you're not able to see what does that, what does that couch or dog bed look like in the living room? And we can do that now. And we have that technology. Uh, so it's done available. Uh, we use Shopify on a lot of our properties. Shopify has this op uh, has this native. Uh, and so you have the ability to deploy these 3D models. Now, the reason why you'd want to deploy 3D models is because not just for the view in my room, but also by being able to articulate the model on multiple axis, you're able to really see what it looks like. Uh, and it really gives you a, a great uh, perception on what the actual product's going to look like when it shows up. Uh, so because of that, just by deploying 3D models, you're going to increase conversion rates somewhere between 30, 20 to 30 percent generally, even without the view in my space. With the view in my space, if you have a product that lends itself well to augmented reality, uh, it's going to be much, much, much higher even. Uh, but uh, so anyway, I saw this opportunity and, and being you know, always looking for a competitive advantage. I, mm -hmm. uh, I contacted a company in Germany that uh, has this uh, unique scanning uh technology they're called scan blue and they have this uh world-class machine that uses some proprietary technology and different algorithms that will scan any object and spit out a 3d model so create a 3d digital twin uh, and it's about 98 percent automated there's about two percent that's human uh that goes in there for quality control making sure the light bounces the right way and that kind of thing why this is so important is because just now all the functionality is becoming available to everyone. So all those e-commerce entrepreneurs out there, you now can deploy 3D models on your website. Uh, most likely on your website natively without the need for an app. People don't have to download an app to use augmented reality um, and people don't need an app to see your 3D model. Um, we can do this now. And so everybody's in a rush to get these models made and created and to digitize their products. Now where the issue really comes from is a few things. One, uh, the way 3D models are made nowadays, they're created by hand, which is fine. A lot of the time it looks great, uh, but it's, it's what it is, is a human interpretation of an object. And they're right. literally creating this in a computer. And, and so oftentimes they look great. Oftentimes they don't. Oftentimes they're inconsistent. Um, and, you know, in this day and age, quality matters. Authenticity is the currency that we trade on in e-commerce, right? What, what you see is what you get, or it's going to be a return. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are creating amazing user experiences with authentic models that really show them that this is what I'm looking at. And when it arrives on the porch, it's going to be the same thing. So authenticity matters. I love that. The other issue with the inconsistency, besides the inconsistency of human modelers with 3D models, you have a scalability problem, right? So uh, let's just say that's fine. If you have a, a small boutique shop that's got five products, that's fine. Um, uh, but what if you have a thousand products? How are you going to get those taken care of? You're going to hire somebody to do a thousand models. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be very expensive. 
So this is where we come in with scan shop. And if you want to learn some more information on it, it's scan.shop or if that's just too, too, uh, too much for you, you can go to scanshop.io. Uh, but scan.shop will show you everything that you need to know. And with scanshop, it, we have the first American-based uh, scan uh, machine here. And so you can okay. send us your objects. We will scan your item for you, and we will send you a 3D model for you to deploy and start putting more money in the register. It's that simple. When you say 3D model, just... Like, correct me if I'm wrong. Are we talking like a 360 video of the product or is this different? This is different. No, it's a different. So a 360 model, a 360 video of the model would only go on one axis, right? So a 3D model is the actual 3D rendering. And you see them all the time in every Apple commercial, in every uh, in every shoe commercial. These are renderings. They're actually not the shoe. They're, you know, they don't have the shoe on a fishing wire floating in front of the uh in front of the camera they're actually literally making a 3d composite model here they're they're um uh, they're using that model to animate it and put it into multiple different forms so you know e-commerce is what we like to talk about because by deploying a 3d model you're going to increase your conversion rates and reduce your returns and if you're a e-commerce entrepreneur you want to increase your conversion rates and reduce your returns so it's super simple but there's a million other applications for it in advertising media Google AdWords is just now getting ready to start deploying 3D models. And so the time really is now, but it is not just a regular once around. Um, in fact, if you go to buddyrest.com, you can see our beds. You can actually zoom in the bed. You can zoom out the bed. You can look at the bottom. You can even go in so tight. You can turn over and look at the, you can look at the care label and read how you're supposed to wash it. That's why a 3D it's incredible. model, authentic 3D model is, is it's not even the future. It is the present. And if it's not on your roadmap, it's, if it's not on your ra radar, you're slipping and it should be, but that's okay. Cause I can help scan dot shop scan dot shop. You guys, you guys heard it from the mouth. I'm definitely going to check it out. Um, you know, we've got about 50 brands that I work with on a monthly basis here at Marknology. Um, you know, we're always trying different things across them, uh, just depending on what's going on and what the, you know, the product type is. Um, you know, we were, I was pushing my brands to be first movers when it came to video ads on Amazon because the ROI is just fantastic. You're beating anyone there, um, you know, to get those ads out. And a lot of smaller brands just don't have all that collateral already built up. You know, either it's just they have one ad type or one video and they're trying to use it for everything. Um, but the time and investment into that uh, is, you know, we're able to gather that and gain that back on the ROI side of deploying those ads, you know? So, it's an investment when it, when it comes to these 3D models, um, but it's an investment that you should already have been making. And if not, it's OK. Um, Shopify just just made this native a couple months ago. And so um, a lot of people like yourself, uh, you know, aren't really even fully aware what the capabilities are. Uh, but the bottom line is, is whether you have five products or five thousand products, we have a solution for you for what what scan shop actually does is uh, on a smaller scale. You send us your item. We will send you a 3D model. However, if you have a bigger, if you're a bigger customer, or you, have, you know, you have a, a big catalog, we actually will come to you and deploy one of our uh, proprietary scan systems inside of your facility. And then you can just scan all day. And, uh, and, and that's how you get digital transformation, get your catalog into, into the digital world. Now, when I say into the digital world, it's also, it's also not just, like I said, augmented reality or media, but it's also virtual reality. So it's also gaming. There's a million different applications. You can take any object, whether it be like this microphone, you can scan the microphone and literally, you know, within a couple of minutes, we'll have a uh, authentic, real digital twin of this microphone that you can use in any application that you want. But if you want to sell more microphones, uh, you should probably, you should probably get on it pretty quick. I love that because, you know, Amazon, I feel like is slower than the rest of e-commerce in a lot of ways, um, you know, whether it's features they're allowing or, you know, because they have everything so template-y. Uh, but Amazon is built for the customer, customer satisfaction. And I think e-commerce sites can learn a lot from that, you know, um, as far as making it, they, they have buyer trust. That's why Amazon is one over websites in general, uh, from a general perspective, is because people trust Amazon. If they don't like it, they can return it. You know, they're getting it in a certain amount of time. We'll see what Q4 looks like as far as getting stuff in a certain amount of time. But, um, you know, I think that's absolutely huge. You talked about authenticity and that's what the game that we're in when it comes to e-commerce. And I couldn't agree more. I just wish I had told brands to invest sooner and, and bigger when it came to photography and, um, 
you know, whether that's photography or video or all of the above, you, you know, it starts with photography and it was, you know, let's have authentic pictures. We're not trying to sell something that's been, you know, photoshopped. We're not trying to sell something that's just like, um, you know, if we're selling pet products, for example, this is people have an emotional connection to their pet. You can't sell products that look like a science project. You know, it's got to be, you got to create emotional photography, emotional video, um, be able to see that in your home, be able to see that in the room. I love it. Well, and, and real quick, that is a differentiator, right? If you look at what uh, a lot of us have, uh, you know, uh, let's just say overseas competition, and they're not the best marketers. And they oftentimes, like in, in my space, you can tell that they, they, didn't, they didn't invest in product photography. They just took a product and they... Uh, Photoshop some dog, they got off Shutterstock on it, right? So this is a differentiation point. If you were making a high-end, high-quality band, you need to invest in your assets, right? And going back to what you were saying, you know, being in being uh, in e-commerce, you already know it's kind of one-on-one stuff that you invest and make better better quality photos uh, increases the uh, perceived value on page, right? So by giving them a better experience. By letting them see the product in and in, in a better quality, it increases conversion rates. So it's not rocket science to understand, well, what if you allow that customer to look at that product from every single angle, zoom in on it. If it's a shoe, look inside the shoe, look at the bottom of the shoe. What if it's, uh, what if it's a couch? I want to be able to put it in my bedroom and see uh, if it matches the, the blinds. You know, these are things that are, are going to make the difference. And it's not much, it's not different than investing in product photography. It's just the next right. evolution of it. Mm -hmm. I agree. And it like if you have a great product, there's nothing to hide. Right. Sure. And, you know, I, I know as someone that helps other brands, I'm not trying to work with brands that don't have a quality product because um, I just don't like selling them. But if you have a great product, if we need to charge that premium because of the ingredients in your product or because you're, um, you know, you're doing things in a more ethical way or whatever it is that creates that higher price point for your product. Let's push those. Let's push those reasons. Let's show that quality of product. Let's show that quality of wood. If you're building something, you know, um, Let's talk about the ingredients, like the texture of the supplements, you know, um, if you have a quality product I'm just show those off and what better than, um, you know, a rendering, a real rendering of the product. Well, and it's super important nowadays with COVID because, you know, not a lot of people are shopping in stores. Right. And so, you know, we were talking about bridging the gap, but it's it's super, super, super important right now to to be investing in these in this type of asset. And at the end of the day, if you look at what you pay for product photography, you know, a good product photography session. If you hire a good photographer, it's going to be somewhere between 500 and $2,000, maybe more. Um, you know, our scans, we can get you a scans of your product, depending on what it is, of course, but more than likely somewhere, but it's very affordably somewhere between three, four, $500. You can have a 3d model, uh, that will uh, instantly increase conversion rates and reduce returns. So it's, a, it's kind of a no brainer. Um, the biggest challenge, once again, here we are again, is educating the customer that this is what's coming and this is what's necessary and this is what's needed. Um, but ultimately, you know, like I said, for entrepreneurs in your audience, uh, uh, if it's not on your roadmap, it needs to be. 100%. And I echo that. Uh, there's just no way around it. And, you know, you're talking about, you're right, like $500 probably a product. Uh, and it may be maybe a little less if you're buying in bulk, like a lot. Um, but if you're just trying to get a, uh, you know, a product shot well from someone of quality, you're talking about 500 bucks. And uh, the thing about, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but once you have, um, that type of rendering, you can, you can put it anywhere in any types of graphics, like, cause you can get every angle of the product and create uh, new content that's fun and engaging and showing, you know, different angles at, at a high quality level. Absolutely. Yeah. You can, the, the limits of this technology uh, are really only our imagination, right? So uh, there, it, the, the things that we can do and the applications that we can disrupt um, are really limitless. I mean, we have so much opportunity. We're focused once again on the on the entrepreneurs that have websites because e-commerce is kind of like, like I said, it's, it's the easiest to see the return on investment. It's right there, right in front of you. Uh, but there is opportunities across the spectrum with technology as it's accelerating. You know, with COVID, they're saying, uh, some people are saying that we've accelerated e-commerce five years. I tend to think it looks more like three years right now, two to three. Uh, but even more so, the reason to 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 you know to to roll up your sleeves and jump in, right? This is the time. Invest in your brand. Invest in your products. 
Uh, if you want to compete, uh, especially with the likes of, of people like the, uh, the large company that you keep mentioning, um, you know, you're going to have to do something other than uh, just brand awareness because uh, you're not going to beat them on brand awareness. You're going to have to do something better than just logistics and service because it's not going to get it done. You're not going to beat their robots and logistics and service. So what are you going to do to differentiate your brand? How are you going to tell the story? How are you going to take the product and put it in the customer's living room? How are you going to raise the perceived value? How are you going to make sure what they order is what they get? And the answer is 3D models and ScanShop is the best, most affordable, most scalable solution to make that happen. I love it. Yeah. And, and around here, like we do focus on Amazon, but, um, you know, my passion really trying to push brands is that holism between, you know, shop official, Amazon, chewy.com. How does everything talk to each other and how do you get the most value out of each? Um, you know, you're going to have customers like you talked about with, you know, with acquiring the different brands and the, and the different avatars, like you're going to have customers that just, you know, they, uh, appreciate a different marketplace. You know, and um, what are you providing of value to make them want to come to your site instead of Amazon? If you had her to offer, if you don't have more content, more, more engagement, uh, maybe a specific newsletter that's living there or ebooks or, you know, customer education, you got to provide that value in the same way that brick and mortar has to provide that value, right? Um, brick and mortar needs to provide something that the web whether it's Shopify or Amazon or social is going to be that customer service point, which can be that, you know, maybe touching, touching the items or texture or getting that, that touch there. So it's, it's all of these are needed, but it's like, which each one brings the ability to bring different values. And it's just a matter of how connect, you know, your customers to each channel. Maybe they're, they're finding you on social because of a video or a blog that posted on your website that's getting reposted or shared and maybe they make the final purchase you know in brick and mortar maybe they make the final purchase on amazon maybe they make the final purchase right there on instacart you know as a as a owner myself um i don't care where they purchase you know i just want to retain that and continue to build that relationship so how can i do that no matter where they purchase um really becomes the question and how i think i think just to really piggyback on what you're saying to anyone listening, it's all about authenticity. It's all about building trust um, in whatever channel that is. Build trust, build consistency, be an authentic brand that people can trust, and you'll be surprised um, you know, how you can get those customers coming back over and over. Absolutely. I think you hit the nail right on the head. And uh, obviously in 2020, if you don't have an omni-channel strategy, uh, you need to get one pretty quick. Uh, but I 100% agree with you. It's all about authenticity. That is the currency we trade. And if you want to give uh, an amazing experience and kind of build a moat around your business, I think it's super important, especially on your direct consumer website, if that's what you're running on, to you make sure that you, you're you bringing value in multiple ways, whether it be that educational piece you were talking about um, or uh, you know making sure that there's something unique and different that raises the perceived value of the customer. You know, ultimately, I like to look at shopping online. Uh, you know, shopping started in person, right? So oftentimes I, I like to, to make some comparisons. But, uh, you know, if you look at the reason why people shop at the local pet store, uh, it's because it's not because they got the best price or they're logistically the best. They like, they like to go in there because they like, they like Sally, the owner. And Sally's really knowledgeable and answers any question they need to know and can educate them about any type of product. And they just can't get that anywhere. They can't get that mm -hmm. at the big box store down the street. They sure as heck can't get it at Walmart. And so, you know, we need to think about these things as we move into this uncertain times and as we start to be, uh, as things start to be super competitive. Because guess what? If people, if if uh, e-commerce was not on a major company's radar, uh, it absolutely 100% is now. Everybody's going all in on e-commerce because they don't have a choice. It's about survival. So uh, as we go into these strange new waters together, um, you know, I highly, I highly encourage you to not, uh, not try to compete directly with the big boys, find unique ways of, uh, make, making your products demonstrable, showing your products, educating the customer and, uh, doing all those other things that really drive them to you versus somewhere else. Trevor, great advice. Um, you know, we're coming up on an hour. I want to, I want to end with one question for you. Um, 
you know, a little bit different than the brands, uh, more about the guy behind the brands. Um, you know, what's something that you're working on, whether it's this time of year or just from pipeline, maybe that's got you headed a certain direction. What's something that you're working on individually as an entrepreneur? Um, you know, a skill set or a mindset shift, um, you know, something you're trying to improve on. Let, let's leave uh, the listeners with something that someone that's experienced, uh, you know, has built uh, multiple brands and multiple businesses is doing it is successful, um, but always trying to grow. What's something you're focused on? Um, you know, that's a great question. Uh, never stop learning, obviously. You know, that's the key. Uh, not everybody has the gift of being able to, in the, of, being, of having the drive to discover things, right? You know, you look around, you see everybody has access to all of the world's knowledge and they waste it by, you know, chatting on Facebook and watching, you know, funny cat videos and, and all sorts of nonsense, right? And there's a place for that. And I think that, uh, I think that that is important because when I was when I was younger, when I was first getting going, um, I oftentimes I have what we call what I call entrepreneurial guilt, which it means I can't sit still, I can't enjoy life, I can't watch TV. I got stuff I've got to do, I've got to build, I got to be successful, I got to grind. Um, now, with all that being said, I will tell you that in the last couple of years, I've really understood the value of being able to unplug, being able to reflect. That's part of it. Um, but that's just also going back to what I was saying about staying, you know, learning and evolving. You know, um, you can't just grind, 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 grind forever. Uh, you have to, you have to change the way you work, adapt to the the way the market's looking. You've got to constantly adapt. And I think that the that the people who are successful and the people that aren't, they really have two differentiators, in my opinion. Um, one, it's that they are adaptable. They, they never stop learning and they adapt to whatever the scenario is. Like Bruce Lee says, be like water. You, you know, if, if you have a pandemic coming, you adapt, you know, it, it's a, uh, whatever it is, you adapt. So adaptability is a big thing. But then the other thing it really is, uh, it sounds simple, but it's actually really complex, but it, it's as simple. I'll just say it as simple as it is. It's don't quit. So for the people who I see that are really successful are the people that are resilient, persistent, and relentless that don't give up. Uh, and the, the, the people who are adaptable, um, I'm fortunate, to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a gift and a curse where I just don't give up on things. And so I'll keep pushing. I will say that I think, uh, a lot of people and uh, would have quit this business many times over. And I've thought about it many times over, but you got to push through. So, um, in this uncertain time in 2020, I would like to leave your listeners with, with not any advice, cause I'm not here to. To give anybody advice like i'm in a position to to share wisdom all i can do is share my experience and in my experience you have to stay adaptable and ultimately you have to make sure that you stay learning and ultimately um don't quit and uh, you'll get there yeah i think it's it's a little cliche but i um it's no one know how to rest learn how to rest and don't quit you know um you got to take a break and and step away and unplug um it can be super hard to unplug when you're in e the e-commerce space as well because everything is reachable from your phone or your or your laptop um you know you can't literally geographically get away from it it can come with you you know anywhere and it is about being relentless and being able to is one of the things I was thankful for um, this year and, and maybe some of that entrepreneurial guilt of being in the right space as well. Um, but, you know, it was just like so being so used to change, um, you know, that for me, when all of this kind of stuff hit, it was just very natural to just adjust and pivot and, you know, do what you got to do um, to survive. And uh, that's something that I think we all uh, in all of our businesses, that was one of the advantages or one of the things I liked about all of this was even in Kansas City, seeing the business owners that would switch from alcohol to hand sanitizer or, you know, we're just pivoting to a patio model or delivering uh, like booze packets or um, just the entrepreneurial spirit that came out of the pandemic and, and a lot of business owners that maybe have been in this routine of optimization and optimizing, optimizing, optimizing. Um, got back to pivoting and, and finding a, a way to survive. And for me, that was 
almost a little invigorating to watch and see kind of the city adapt and, and change and be able to, um, you know, stay afloat. So, so thank you. That was great. Uh, you know, a great piece. And I think something that we, we all are working on and, and for me, it's, it's not quit, but it's learn how to unplug and, uh, you know, don't be too stuck in my ways because I'm focused on some plan I laid out and put six months of effort into that I'm unwilling to, you know, take a step back and, and pivot and change direction. So Trevor, uh, full of great advice today. Thank you for being on. Um, once again, thank you to our, our sponsor for today's show, uh, Pipeline Entrepreneurs, sponsoring this episode of Startup Puzzle. If you're interested in learning more about joining their 2021 fellowship class, head to PipelineEntrepreneurs.com. It will also be in the show notes. This is episode one of four. Um, super excited to, to hear from some more Pipeline Entrepreneurs. And, and Trevor, uh, nice to meet you. I'm in the AC area as well. And I know you're in Wichita, but if we get the chance, we've got to connect and, uh, you know, talk shop as another e-commerce e uh, enthusiast around here. It'd be, it'd be a pleasure to meet you in person. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be up there sooner rather than later. And I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, make sure you go and apply for Pipeline. Get your dog some stuff at Buddy Rest and get some 3D models at scan.shop. And I hope to hear from you soon. Anybody who wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, my name is Trevor Krotz, C-R-O-T-T-S. I'm happy to connect, happy to have a conversation. Uh, and I live for that stuff. So uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. No problem, listeners. All of his contact info will be in the notes as well. Uh, so if you're driving and didn't get a chance to write any that down um you know just go there and link out to his linkedin link to his brands um you guys have a great day thanks trevor thank you